began from the very beginning of time, right? And I can ask you one question right now. What does history tell us here about Africa? Who discovered Africa? If you write right now on Google who discovered Africa, you find out that is one white man that he came and discovered Africa. And you can ask yourself that how can you discover a place that already exists? How can you discover a place that people already live in that place? It is impossible, but that's what the history tells us. That's what people believe about Africa, that it was discovered by a white man. This guy, he came, and then he went back, he gave a report, and then the next we know is colonialism, because those guys, they sat somewhere to divide Africa like a piece of cake, because they discovered it, they own it, it belonged to them. But that is us, we discovered, we're the first people to know. And today you have a lot of people around the world that they think that Africa was discovered by them. Yeah, hey, 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 guess who's back? Whoa, whoa. Guess who's back like he never left, man. I'm here when the test is back. Welcome to the hidden hand. I know you guys, maybe you guys have missed me. Maybe you guys didn't miss me. Whoever did, welcome to the stream, bro. It's a little chilly today, but I'm not in the East, uh, in East Africa. I'm not in the East Coast, but in East Africa. In the highlands of East Africa, it's a little bit chilly night. It's been... It's been a very interesting week or months since I've been here, but uh, how are you guys, guys? If I may ask, welcome to the stream, we're Greg Moon, welcome, Marie Antoinette. Uh, who else? Let me see. Where there you guys? Uh, don't forget the GoFundMe. This campaign is still going on, guys. Just uh, five euros from 5,000 people hasn't changed. We've reached 4,202. Well, let's go, let's go today. Maybe we can go to, I don't know, I'm ambitious today. Maybe four to 50. We, we go, we, we make it a quarter. For those who are feeling generous, it's a Sunday, guys. For, the, for, the, for those who went to church, you know, Karibuni. Karibuni 20 Sadaka Pia Swahili Nation. Now when you're at the end, uh, even today, for those who are in Kenya, there was a church service in the state house and where the president lives. Yeah, we are in interesting times, man. We are living in interesting times. So yeah, welcome to the stream, guys. Uh, today we're talking about, uh, let me read the topic for those who don't know. Today we're talking about, uh, yeah. they, don't, they don't show the topic from this side. And I'm the one who wrote the topic. But it's basically the concept of time in African culture. You know, people don't understand this, by the way. People don't understand that uh, in Africa, not in Africa, let me be specific, East Africa, children didn't inherit their parents' names. That wasn't a thing. That, okay, let me not say East Africa as a whole, but East Africa majority. Of the, of the cultures and the tribes in East Africa, children did not inherit the parents' names. Like you, right, right now, you know, that's the trend, right? That's the thing. And it makes it, that's a foreign thing that, that now you, you get your father's name. And you know, that is a foreign thing. That was not a thing 
200 years ago. I'll say I like to say 100 years ago, but uh, maybe maybe let's say 120, 120 to one before 120 years ago, it wasn't a thing. You were not named because of your parents, right? So yeah, welcome to this. I think I've already welcomed you, Red Moon Music. For those who haven't come to the stream, welcome to the stream. Don't forget to donate to the One Africa funding. We are into a two today's target is two fifty. Yeah, let's make it a quarter. Listen, let's bring it to a quarter. For those, I think for those some of you guys, I think it's morning. I think uh, for some of you guys, I might be evening. Or, in here, it's already night. It's nine fifty-four. Uh, yeah, guys, it feels good to be back. But uh, yeah, uh, for those who are in the group, for those who are already in the group, I've already dropped the link. Today we are going to an article, not an article, a journal, a paper written by. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see if I can share this. Stop the screen. See if I can share this so that we can do it all. We can go through it together. Here we are. Here we are. So this is just the concept of time in East Africa. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let's see if I can expand it. Oh, it's expanded. There we are. So it's a journal. It's part of a journal living on a lower time, recording the sequence. So we're looking at a tribe in East Africa called Living on Lu Luo Tribe, Recording Sequence, Duration, and History, and Biography of Rural African Society. So basically, this is an article, not an article, a paper, yeah, a peer-reviewed paper. It's a paper written by Michael Dieter and Ingrid Albich. I don't know who these guys are, but... I was uh, I I came across this topic because uh, I guess I was having a discussion with somebody and uh, talking about way we're talking about time like how did our ancestors view time like you know today we look at time o'clock twelve o'clock six o'clock five o'clock you know and uh, maybe Tuesday January sixteenth twenty twenty two you know that's the modern day of time but I was curious on how our ancestors. Uh, how did they tell time? How did they go about? Because uh, they did go about doing the business. They did go about uh, scheduling. They had schedules, right? So they, they must have had a way of telling time, right? So they did some, uh, just got curious. Then they were, and I did some research and I found this article. Let me see if I can give you guys the link. For those in the group, I've already posted the article in the group the journal in the group, but uh, for those who are not in the group, let me see if I can post the link here. There we go. There we go. So yeah, for those who wish to access the link, there we go. So yeah, today we're talking about time, man. Eh? Timekeeping, African time. You know, guys like to talk about African time. Yeah, today we're talking about, but not 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 in the normal sense in which it's been used. But this is African time in the cultural sense, in the historical sense, right? So let's see. Now, what I like about this uh, article is that they actually they actually cite African uh, sources. Of information, I just don't. Uh, okay, let's talk about the tribe itself. The Luo people live in the basin which surrounds the Winam Gulf of Lake Victoria, Western Kenya. They speak a Nilotic language related to that of several peoples in Uganda and the South Sud and Sudan, basically, practically South Sudan. Their livelihood depends on uh, small scale agriculture, animal husbandry, and fishing. You see here they quoted uh, Ogot 1967. This is this is a, a writer and an author. Is it a historian, a Kenyan historian? So this is why I liked it, and it gave me a lot of insight also. 
So what what we have here is a typical East African tribe, basically. A lot of East African tribes they have a lot in common, basically. They have much more in common than much man, than uh, what in common. Like especially when it comes to time, especially when it comes to timekeeping, time uh, and chronology and all that, they have a lot in common. So that's the. So they grew. They grew. So this is a tribe that uh, happened in. They had animals. Basically, they had herds. They practice uh, fishing, and they also practice. So they did the old both three. They did three. They had agriculture, animal husbandry, and fishing. So all. They did all of the three. Some you just did the agriculture. Some did animal. Some were just herders, like the pastoralists. Some were just. I don't think there was any, one that was just simply fishing. But here's what. Uh, here's what I uh, like. Now, when I talk about East Africa, let me not uh, be too wide. I'm talking about Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and maybe not Rwanda, maybe not a bit. Uh, I'm talking about not Rwanda. Uh, maybe Rwanda, maybe not. Rwanda and Burundi and the Congo, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. There's a bit of kinship there. But in uh, what what I liked about in this in this article or in this uh, paper that was, uh, I don't know, is it a journal? They call it journal. They call it a paper. The, the guys, you know, the, the things that you publish from 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 university research or something from academic research paper journal whatever you feel like calling it i don't know if you can call it an article maybe i'm degrading their work but what i like about it is that they show you know sometimes we talk about africa and uh, i see this talked about a lot is the concept of uh, kingdoms right you know like oh africa we were we was kings and eh? we were kings and queens, you know. Well, no, here is a typical East, not in East Africa though. Apart from Ethiopia though, apart from Ethiopia and the Buganda Kingdom, there were kingdoms sparsely where they, they were here and there. They were king, but majority of people weren't in living in kingdoms, right? In East Africa, majority were just in a different type of system, in a different type of. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say political. But it was a different type of system, right? And uh, and and you know, people think if there was no king, maybe there was a chief. No, there was no chief. There was no hierarchy. The hierarchy was not the way we would think of it today, you know. And this is why I like this uh, particular this uh, this what this this journal. I'm going to be calling it paper and a journal, whatever. Man, basically, an academic paper. What I liked about it is that they talked about something that I didn't. That is normally not normally talked about. You know, people always talk about the kingdoms of Africa, the great king. But nobody, but a lot of in East Africa, most people weren't ruled by kings. The fact this in this tribe, which is typical East African, there was no ruling class. You know, but so how did they go about their things? How did they go about their society, right? And that's where they said, and this is where I found it uh, very interesting because this is where the concept of time comes in. This is so so the the way they 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 carried out or their society was uh I don't want to say governed, but yeah, probably governed or probably the society functioned, how their society functioned had a lot to do with time and the concept of time and their concept of time. You know, this is uh, an, our ancestral concepts of time, you know. So yeah, the traditional political structure was a cephalus. A ce yeah, here is it. A ce yeah. So most of East Africa was a cephalus. If I'm pronouncing it terribly, uh, you know, English is a colonizer language, so big deal there. Eh? A cephalus. No. This means uh, this were these were tribes that were ruled without central authority. They didn't have like a king or a chief, you know, or a ruling class, you know. And this is a big tribe. The Luo tribe there are millions of people. They're not they're not just one tribe, and they are spread out of 
and they're not spread, they don't just in Western Kenya, they in Uganda, they in Tanzania, they in Ethiopia too. In fact, they in Ethiopia and they in South Sudan. So this is a huge tribe. It's, uh, it goes into the probably tens of millions of uh, people who belong to this ethnicity. So it's not a small, like, uh, you know, like, no, it's a big tribe. So, you know, let's see. Let's see how this, how it, it became this large and still that there was no, it grew to this level of, uh, you know, this millions of people, millions of people belonging to this ethnicity, yet they still did not have a central authority. So how was their society run? You know, that, that is where to go to explore today. Obviously, I've already given the leakage that it's it's something to do with time, right? So let's go. Although there's there's no they they now exist a system of government of of government appointed chiefs, you know, who serve as the the chiefs, the tribal chiefs. That wasn't a thing. That wasn't a thing a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago. That wasn't a thing. There were no tribal chiefs. That's a that's a colonial makeup, you know. That's a colonial. What is it? A fabrication, you know. That oh, we got the chief of this tribe. No. They were not tribe, there was no ruling class, but they still they were still a way that that society was managed. So let's continue. Current administrative divisions are based upon territorial boundaries of the various Luo subgroups as they existed at the moment of imposition of, uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, the current, uh, yeah, it's basically the current boundaries as they are. Existed. Wow, you know, uh, back then there's this book called The History of the Southern Law. It talks about this. There's also, you know, I'm going to talk about. There's also living with the prehistoric people. It talks about the Kikuyu. They also have a similar, similar nini, similar way of uh, viewing time. But they they had. Uh, I think it's, let's just let's do this. Then we'll look at the other ones first. In the pre-colonial in the pre-colonial era, political organization was based on fluid alliances among these shifting subgroups in approximate in approximation to the segmentary lineage system. Ooh, now you're going to avoid some of. Uh, some uh, weird uh, statements here from people who are torn. This is an old article, I think. I think this is an old article. So sometimes they, they, the way they talk is like a product of the time, a little bit racist. Yet, yet as we will discuss before, time and the process of reckoning, of reckoning time, has important social, operational, and personal significance for the law. While people in Western societies are often said to be merely obsessed with time, saving it, spending time, saving time, measuring it even more, ever more precisely. A pervasive argument with time, engagement with time, is equally evident in the Luo society, mean, meaning that even African tribes had their own uh, engagement with time. For example, Luo, here's what, now here's where I, this is what got me to research because names in Luo names in Luya and uh, let me talk about Kikuyu also. Kikuyu names. These people na were named after time period. When you're born, you don't get your father's name. You didn't get your dad's name. You didn't get your mother's name. You got the name of the time period you're born. That is how East African people were. Made. So this thing of inheritance. Your name told you there was there, you, there was no lineage. There was this thing lineage is a new thing, really, in African society, in East African society. Lineage is the kind of a new thing, but it wasn't about lineage. It was about the time you were born. You know, it was about when you're named. It's like you're named during this time. So let's talk. Let's continue. Just let's. Luo personal names were very commonly have common very commonly have a temporary origin, linking an individual to a time of day a season of the year, and a stage of the temporal sequence. Temporal sequence is the, like a year is a temporal sequence, meaning that one season, when the seasons begin to repeat themselves, so one cycle is a temporal sequence or a historical event. Moreover, structurally, structuring of time figures prominently in the representation of social relations and reproductive 
this a little more. Gibberish. Given the absence of explicit speculation, it is largely examined and more quotidian. There's a lot of uh, big words here. For those who, who want to use a dictionary, here's another word. Heck that this means. I don't know what the heck this means. Quotidian practice of reckoning time that one is able to discern some underlying concept in which people hold the subject and their perception of the sequence. Basically, is just trying to find out. It's basically this whole paragraph is just about uh, the introduction. As with most people, the Luo's conception of time is not a unitary or homogeneous one. Rather, it consists of a complex matrix of linear and cyclical conceptions, which are applied to different facets of life, articulated in a variety of ways in the process of reckoning time in different contexts. In general, for the Luo, passage of time is a relational concept, and the Luo reckon time by a process of establishing relations between cyclical phases and sequential series of events. This process, this, pro, this process of chronological reckoning serves to establish both the order and duration of events and to link past time to present time and personal time to more abstract temporal structures. Let's talk about it. Oh, this word again, quotidian cycle. I'm going to have to Google it. The shortest and the most basic cyclical concept, conceptualization of time centers around the observation of the daily alternation, alternation between night and day. The movement of the sun and the moon across the sky. This daily cycle, okay, stargazy. This daily cycle is divided into named segments slightly of slightly variable length with structure the performance on the performance of quotidian, I'm have to Google this word. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can Google this word because it's looking like it's a big deal. So quotidian means, okay, something that occurs every day, daily. It basically means daily. Okay, yeah. this is old school English. So this is daily activities. So this is the daily circle. Okay, now I've understood. Personal identity is often linked to these periods as people are commonly named after the time of day during which they were born. For example, Odi O Cheng, Odi Cheng, which derives from the term the sun, which is Cheng, is the period of midday. Somebody, okay, when you're born in midday, you're called uh, Odi O Cheng, from roughly 8, 11, if you're born roughly between 11 and 3 p.m., that's what you're, by Western clock time. And boys born during this time will be called O Cheng, while girls born with this. So if you're born during the midday, between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. will be named O Cheng or A Cheng. O Diambo is a term from of the following, late afternoon, late afternoon or evening, giving rise to names like O Diambo for males and A Diambo for females. O Cheno is a period of night, hence the name O Cheno and A Cheno. So yeah, you can just tell by somebody's name what time of the day they were born. However, those born after midnight are called O War or O Duor. And a war. Early morning is known as Okinyi, yielding the name Akinyi. Males born during this period are often more called Omondi. This is the morning guys. After the word Mondo, meaning early or punctual. Late mornings and Onyango, which means, or oh, late morning is Onyango or Anyango. And this completes the cycle. Oh, yeah. The fact that Luo dispositions of daily time reckoning have not yet been transformed by a commoditized hourly clock system of capitalism. 
does not mean that they lack the abstract sense of time required for various tasks. See? So this guy was like, just because uh, their, their time, their, their method of seeing time or counting time is not uh, the, the, the modern one, doesn't mean that they don't count time, basically. Yeah. Moreover, it's quite clear that they make temporal evaluations about being on time and being slow. You know, yeah, they, are, they kind of know if you're late. So you can tell me if you can meet, if they can, they could make, they, there's exactly what they're trying to say, they could schedule a meeting. So if you could schedule something, that means that you knew, you had an idea of what time is on how to carry out time. What's happening? Oh yeah, okay. So where am I, where am I? A more important difference is the absence of the link between lower time units and the conception of labor time as a commodity. So this guy goes and says that European time or Western time is a, it has been commodified because of labor. Let me, where does it start? Where does it start? I think this is where he talks about yeah, labor, labor time. Therefore, time reckoning has not yet served as a vehicle for the transformation of, the, of dispositions towards all activity. I think because of labor and capitalism, this article claims that uh, because of labor and capitalism, European time is uh, more of a commodity. Like you work for eight hours, you work for six hours, you know, there's an eight hour work day. So because of that, it, there is a, that, I think it makes it like, this is the big difference between African time and uh, European time because of capitalism. Basically, let's see how he goes about uh, talking about his point. The seasonal cycle. The law also recognize that longer temporal, temporal means yearly. Basically when it repeats, the longer natural temporal cycle, a regular seasonal cycle based on upon weather patterns, essentially rainfall, which structures agricultural activities, crop processing, house construction, craft production, diet, and other things. This seasonal cycle and other short periods of associated activities determined by it serve to reckon the passage of time throughout the cyclical unit of the year, which is Higa. Okay. In the absence of wide acceptance of the imported Western monthly calendar, events during the yearly cycle tend to be indicated by reference to cyclical phases. During the period of long rains, during the, okay, yeah, this is cyclical phases, meaning, meaning that um, the year was divided into like the period of long rains, the basically seasons during the, the period of weeding at the time of seasonal hunger and the first harvest. I think uh, there's something called Kwanzaa in, a, in the US. I think there's something called Kwanzaa that uh, took about the first harvest. It should be noted that unlike the calendar, this cycle is not uniform in terms of the number of days, nor is it uniform for all duo, because variations in elevation result into different weather patterns. Basically, because of the region, the huge region or the vast regions that uh, these people kind of covered, the seasons weren't the same, you know, the seasons in the highlands weren't the same as in maybe in the lower altitude or different time, different zones. So time was also, because of that, there were slight variations of time. For those living in the low elevation close to the shore of the Winam Gulf, the year was divided into rainy season and dry season. For those living in the hills, which constitutes the outer boundary of the basin. The year was divided into periods of long rains, short rains, separated by two dry seasons. For those living between the two short rains and occasional, are occasional but not predictable phenomena. Each of these patterns tends to have a different cycle of agricultural activities associated with it. <clears throat> so basically they're talking about, okay, here I think he talks about time. He's just introducing the time in terms of how these people build time in the daily, in the yearly, that, oh, that was the yearly cycle, Let me check. Yeah, seasonal cycle, then this is the week. Though not traditional, cyclical intervals of, of uh, short durations between the two cycles 
are now recognized are now also recognized these are weeks with named days this concept of reckoning time is largely a, as a result of several processes which occurred during the period of colonization so yeah oh yeah i don't think i'm interested in the what happened during colonization other cyclical conceptions of time fall roughly under what is called structural time this temporal mode includes what might be called life cycle time generational time which allows except for the recent generation i think this was in the 40s the luo do not have a system of formal age sets or age grades but rather a conception of ideally life cycle stages through which individuals pass over the the course of their lives each stage is reckoned is reckoned on the basis of biological on on the on the journey on to journey on to journey on to journey there english today has refused man on to journey and changes in social status which stage of expectations of appropriate gender specific behavior some changes between stages are explicitly marked as events of ritual performance marriage widowhood while others change the other changes are marked, are marked simply by a gradual assumption of symbols or behavior of a new status girls at the age of courting women so basically the your age one of the things that determine your age is not, not not only the day not only your name because your name you could tell about could talk about the time of the, the time you are born but also your behavior you know like as a girl if you i think uh, when you start I think when you start uh, having menstruation I think that was a specific marker during uh, and we even menopause that kind of became a specific marker thus the age of a person may be characterized as example her breasts are coming out okay so this guy is went to her breasts are coming out or she is beginning to have adolescence basically or she is a married woman he is an elder in order to calculate the age of a person as passage of a specific amount of time as is necessary for past life cycle stages will be linked to historical events by the process in which he, in which he used to reckon biography a lot of english in this article today but this is where i wanted us to reach generational time is extremely important as a means of reckoning both history and personal identity upon meeting another person it is ex- it is immediately invoked as a statement of identity and it serves to establish social distance between individuals now here is where we will talk about hierarchy you know because there was no ruling class there was no political class there was no king there was no queen or, or there was no priest so how did well, how did they establish hierarchy the distance uh, past machon is conceived as the history of cyclical processes and successive segmentation of lineages from a common lower or resulting so the the law believed that their ancestor is ramogi resulting into a dendritic system of connections among all lower lineages this process is perceived and and impersonalized and accidental anecdotal terms as the story of sporadic splits between sons of a common father this segmentation events okay so i was wrong in the beginning i, I thought there were no lineages but there is one lineage they, they believe they all come from one person called ramogi so that's a lineage and i think different clans had specific lineages like this is this is the clan because they like at some point where they split you know i think they have those types of history hence membership in a current lineage implies a specific social distance from other luo lineages which is calculated on the basis of temporal distance of segmentation so basically how far how far you are from this other clan maybe how separated is calculated by what they think maybe they say okay your clan split from the this clan maybe 100 years ago so the you know i think that was this is what is trying to say with a lot of complicated english 
Let's see if I can skip this. So this temporal distance has a specific significance in structuring personal interaction as it determines who, ooh, who one can marry, where one can expect political allies, with, with, with whom one is expected to share, whose funerals must one attend, where one has rights to land, where and a host of, okay, there are so many other things, but, ah, you see, I think this is where uh, Africans, uh, this, this is where I, I think we were arguing with Tanzania a couple of weeks ago, a, little, I mean, a couple of months ago, that people, in, people are not allowed to marry from the same clan. And if they see that that clan is a little bit too close to our clan, you're not even allowed to marry from that clan. You know, you're, you're supposed to, you're, you're meant to marry, I think at least to, I think this is in Luo, this is not even just in Luo, this is in Luo, I think it's in Nigeria, it's in, I think it's in uh, Kalenji, it's also in, uh, I think it's in the, all, I think it's in the Nilotic and Bantu groups in, in Kenya, and I think also in just, I'm for sure Tanzania. I don't know about Uganda because there was also that Uganda kingdom, the, you know, there were a couple of kingdoms in Uganda, but the, the Luo in Uganda were, were just the same as this guy. Because I've seen, because I've seen, uh, I've seen some, I've seen it in social media where, when I was doing some small, small research, I saw that yeah, the law in Uganda they don't have kings. It's the same thing. All laws everywhere. I think apart from the ones in South Sudan. I think I don't know. So this, uh, okay, I've talked about this. Generational time also structures relationships between individuals with lineages or lineage segments. For example, two male of identical chronological age may stand in the relationship of either brothers, father, or son. So, okay. Depending upon the temporal depth of your genealogical connection. So basically, maybe if you're from the same clan, you're just brothers. If you're from the same, but you know, there was also polygamy was practiced, like vigorously practiced back then. That's why there was, this, you know, I think one of the reasons why you're not allowed to marry from the same clan, polygamy was vigorously practiced. So basically somebody, you don't, you know, if you come from the same clan, you're practically brothers, you know, even if you may not, maybe you, you may not know, maybe you may not have the same uh, father or something, but because you feel like your, your lineage is the same, you know, from from the perspective of the father of all, I think from Ramogi, who is like the source of all laws or something like that. They see your lineage is the same, so you're practically family. And so it is weird for you guys to, maybe if it's a woman and that's your sister, basically, it's a big deal. Till today, by the way, till today, it's a big deal. Because I remember, I remember uh, this thing where people, people are saying, don't ever marry from the same village. Why should you not marry from the same village? Because you might be marrying your cousin or something like that. It's just, it, and it's happened a couple of times, guys uh, found out that, oh my God, your cousins, you know, because you come from the same, that's why it's very important. They say when you're dating, it's very important to take your, your, your significant other home to your home, like ancestral home, so that you know, you know, if you come from the same village, you, <clears throat> things are not good, you know? And they say you do it early when, before you fall in love, because when you fall in love, even if, you know, People, people, when they're in love, they don't care. They can marry their cousin in the name of love. So they usually say, "This is this is what my aunt said." My, my aunt is very old. She always says, "Always, even in the beginning of the relationship, let people know, let, trust your lineages." You know, as in, <laughs> before the love sets in, trust your because you know when you're in love now. Oh my God, really, people become rude. You know, it's hard. It's hard, very hard for you to, you know. <laughs> you can ignore and you marry your cousin eh? because you know the love is too strong. Yeah? When love, it's very hard to give them advice or separate. So this structural relationship will have a great deal to do with the behavior of 
what is appropriate between yeah, basically this is what you're saying what is appropriate between two people because of this lineage okay we will employ the term ritualized ritualized sequ sequential time to indicate other cyclical manifestations of time that use temporal sequence of action to structure social relations symbolically this practice is this practice is pervasive in nature and law life found in wide variety of contexts and it's closely linked with the use of space for similar purposes so yeah here here's where we talk about the hierarchy now as noted earlier the lu have traditionally acephalous acephalous means they don't have a centralized leader with an oh, egalitarian political ethos and you know let me tell you something let me tell you something about uh, these cultures these cultures are still there you know people people, people think that africa maybe we've lost them but if you find if you look at even the political situation like currently in uh, people uh, like you find that people are still even their political views have been modernized but you can still find that that uh, that aspect of their ancestral culture is still strong even when they have maybe if they are like here you see egalitarian or people who don't want a king king pins or something i don't know but you find that aspect is still there you find that even their political views though now modernized in the modern context but it's still this they still have they share the same because of the culture it just becomes a, more it becomes what yeah like look at the policies that these people tend to favor and policies it's something somebody should write a paper about that actually that like the politics of africa is quite different from the politics of maybe the west or something people think yeah they oh it's just tribal and they just dismiss it as tribal but you can you could find that even in kenya you find that there are tribal alliances like people like even in the last in the previous election you found that maybe people from western kenya they have the same views or same political views you find people from the coast also have the same political views from people from western kenya then you find people from from uh, rift valley and um, people from central kenya have similar political views and you can and you just go to the culture you find okay yeah so these people are these people their culture is technically egalitarian or technically socialist you know it can it 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 it, it uh, aligns more with socialism while others is like oh, no 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 this one this guy is like the kikuyu they they used to have uh, if you look at their structure i think we're going to cover it again maybe even during this maybe if we have time i'll call i'll make cover it but you can find oh this, this this is a little bit more in line with some capitalism you can find that it's a bit more in line because of how they divided their land land ownership they had land ownership and they had uh, you know like the way they did it's, it's just it, very interesting way of uh, of just social functioning it's just so interesting you can find oh, okay so uh, you, you find that these things just manifest in the modern politics or in the in the current political situations of, of the of the country or of all africa all african countries you can just find that if you if you explore these things like if people just read these things you will find so much some just a lot of interesting things about your africa that you will never have known if you had not just you know researched or something like that but here we are in soil nation so we we are also giving you the clues however relations of authority certainly exist okay here yeah, let me go as noted yeah it was uh, acephalous meaning that there was no central authority but and there was no priestly class of people or other rulers who are able to exert control through the manipulation of you know secret knowledge or you know priestly knowledge you know how like like, like the church they you know the church oh, we have knowledge you know that priestly knowledge or ritualistic you know they, they were they were know that they were witch doc let's not call them witch doctors medicine men they were medicine men they were but they were they had no power the way people thought because and we and we, we and we, if you look at the first episode of the hidden hand we talked about how african uh, morality came from did not come from god the way the religion in africa was structured 
African societies were structured is it, it came from the human, the morality came from you. You decided what was moral. You as an individual or you decided what was moral and then projected it outside. But unlike the modern religion where I, the person who decides what's moral is God, you know? And that's so, so God tells you, this is what is moral, this is what is immoral, you know? That is what. But in African societies, and this is one, it's a good example where there is no priest, even the, the priest or the medicine men, they did not have that much power over the society. It's because people could determine that maybe you, you are an immoral medicine. Not because of your own uh, thoughts and your own uh, what your own uh, perspective of morality mattered. Basically, the individual perspective of morality mattered. So people could just you know, it was a very interesting time. I would love, I would have honestly loved to see what living if, if there was no colonization, I probably would be living in that type of society and just see what happened, what to, how how do people communicate how. Yeah, Will have been so interesting to see. In, however, authority existed, huh? and there was. Here's how authority. Now this is what I'm talking about. However, relations of authority certainly existed, and they were structured in the principle of seniority. Seniority is really a sequential temporal concept, transformed into a social concept. Basically, the typical African age, you know. In lower society, relations of seniority are continually evoked, reiterated and naturalized in ritual daily practice. This means daily, including the particularly ritualized temporal sequence of action. Basically, I think temporal means yearly. So yeah, for example, or chronologically, for example, which Within each polyg polygna polygamous homestead, this I think is a spelling yeah. polygamous homestead, the first wife occupies a pos now here is where we were arguing with Tanzan. And uh, you know, Tanzan talks about a lot about gender relations. And uh, here we were arguing, I think not in a in a stream, people were arguing about the gender, gender relations in Africa, you know, the role of women and the role of men in Africa. And it was so interesting because I read, this is actually what picked my mind here. In a, the first way, you know, people thought that maybe women, I don't know, when you talk about polygamy or the role of women, you might assume that women were oppressed, right? But here's how powerful, and there was no such thing as that a woman is, uh, like a man is more powerful than a woman or a woman was more powerful than a man, as it's like here. Like everybody had their duty according to the chronology of time. Like you had your your duty was not your duty was not uh, told by the man or something. Your duty was spelled. It's like an al algorithm. It's like an algorithm, right? It's like according to the chronology of time, you're supposed to look. Just look at this. The first wife occupies the position of seniority and authority over the other wives, right? This authority is evoked by the position of a house and the fact that it must be built first in the homestead, like. See, you see how something like, like first, before you build your homestead, the first wife, the, the home, the whole, the home of the first wife has to be built first. That's the first house to be, not the man's, not the man's homestead, not the man. It's the first wives. You see. So let's let, let's continue. This is where I really got interested. Where where, where my where my where my, oh, I've lost it. No, here. Yeah. After that. After the first wife has been built her house, by then they lived in separated. This is one thing I also promote that this thing of living and sleeping together in the same bed for like decades. It's not, it's not, I don't know why. Who forced you guys? You know, you know, you're going to start to, you're just going to start hating each other. I don't know. I feel like you're going to just start getting, you know, you know, you know, you know, you guys need space, you know. Your wife needs to your wife needs to have her own home and you need to have your own. That's that's how our ancestors did it. And I think I support that. I support till today. Like maybe let me work hard so that maybe even me have my own home and my wife has her own home. But within the same uh, compound, eh? <laughs> Yeah. But you know you can be you can be more modern and you can be more progressive and you can have different 
compounds. But uh, nah, nah, nah. But look how they used to it. The wife used to have her, her own hut, and basically, you are the, the first, the husband had his own home. But everybody had their own home. This authority evoked. Where am I? But also by the fact that she must continually initiate a number of sequences of activities for the home instead. Basically, look at how how many how important the first wife did. Like like she had a, she had her. It was like an organization where the first wife is like a position, you know, and you run your position, and the husband has his own position, and she runs. You are, you have your own set of responsibilities, you know, and you look. Each year, the first wife, and, and each year, the first wife must be the first woman in her homestead to sow her crops. And no others can begin. Basically, no, the harvest, there is no harvesting without the first wife. If the first wife cannot, does not begin the harvesting, that home does not harvest. That homestead does not do a harvest. The man can't do anything about it. You see? You see how powerful, like the, the power was not, this is, it was a very interesting structure. That uh, is like you know. I think when you look at the modern structure, where it was about, it's about you live. You, it was about the woman had a lot of power to leverage. She had a lot of leverage in her, in her pockets, right? She could like you know. So if she got angry and if you made that, you're like, you know what? I'm not harvesting, and nobody's going to eat. You know, they will be because the algorithm says that the first wife has to begin the first act. So she had a lot of things to leverage in that relationship. For So it was a very interesting dynamic, you know? Let's continue. Where am I? Each year, yeah, there must be the first, and no others can begin until she does. Thus, although the seasons are seen to be a result of natural cycles, the periods of activity associated with them must be initiated by the appropriate human. <laughs> yeah? Let me let me highlight this. The periods of activity associated with the seasons must be initiated by the appropriate human agency carried out in a proper sequence. You yeah. know? So it's not the man to go and go in. no 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 it has to be the first wife. So if you treated your wife, if your wife was angry with you and she doesn't do it, you're in trouble. And it, and, it, and it continues to say this way. Right? Among other initiatives, the first wife must also be the first to begin harvesting and begin brewing, oh, even the beer. The first wife must be the first to begin harvesting and be, to begin brewing the beer and from, from the new crop. Uh, this is the sorg this is the, this is the sorghum beer. I forgot the name of it. The beer of sorghum, of course. What's the name? Oh. We were talking about this a while back. What's the name of it? What's the name? It's basically a traditional brew. Likewise, as a widow, okay, the first wife must undergo the ritual mating with the, ooh, with the brother or the husband, which signifies the end of mourning. Until she does this, no repair can be done on the roofs of any of the houses of the homestead. Okay. Yeah, so this is a this is where I was talk about the and there's a video I might show you by that. But uh, back then, like I told you, man, women were not uh, women were not restricted to the husband. Like the brother called, uh, like when you have a wife, that wife was not necessarily belonging to you. Like even your brothers called uh, partake. And you could take, you could partake in your brother. It was a very interesting system. So you could find that there was a lot of uh, sexual liberation back in the day. There's like <laughs> that was actually there's a video actually of women talking about this, and that's why actually in African society it's very difficult to detect an infertile man. You know because but uh, you know because women were a bit liberal, you know, so you you don't know, you know you. She'll have the baby, the baby will be her, but you know, it's very difficult. The baby belonged to the clan, you know, the baby, the baby belonged to the village. It didn't belong to like you as a, that's why it did not get your name. One of the reasons why you could not pass down, it's not, it's not a thing, the, the baby belonged to the village. So there was a lot of uh, sexual liberation. So it was very difficult 
even in african society that's why in african society oh, it is very difficult to call a man infertile it was very difficult because uh, only an infertile woman will be found even in the stories you could hear it is very difficult to find a story where the man is infertile because of the you know <laughs> the village the village the baby is from the village you know so i mean it was very easy to detect an infertile woman but an infertile man is very so a man will not even know that he is not fertile you know it is very it is a, it, it's a very inter- i'll show you i'll give you the link to that video it's uh, like an hour i talk about all these things but let's continue where am i where am i yeah yeah similar evocations so yeah this is where if the first if the husband dies the father he, you know she there is a ritual mating of the brother of the husband so the woman and 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 the way you, this thing is thing is not forced like until she does this until she agrees to do this there is no repair that can be done in that homestead so there is no house being built in that homestead no repair until she does so when she is comfortable to do this or if she refuses i don't know it's like damn it's down you know that homestead is down but uh, yeah it's a very interesting like i said it's like it's it's like it was run by just specific events in a chronology like in a sequence specific events during are supposed to occur in a specific sequence like that's why i like to say they were ruled by not not they were not ruled by a king or a priest or a political class or a, but a specific uh, like a specific algorithm right and a, a specific uh, instructions in a specific sequence by done by a specific person you know it's like a basically like constitution right it's like it was ruled by a con, like an it's like a yeah, it's a constitution i think that i think that's the best way to describe it similar evocation of seniority may be seen in a sequence of marriageability for sons at a homestead such that the most senior son this is still practiced even today you cannot you, must first must marry first and establish his own house in the homestead before other sons may so yeah the second born or the third born and this is done uh, till today you can't marry before the first born is married my cousins actually who are come from the we are going they the, <laughs> the first born was forced to marry quickly because the second born was already looking like he wanted to marry and he was looking impatient and so he was like hey first born so the first one i was first <laughs> uh is it the algorithm is still continuing to, to you know, till today but yeah <laughs> but yeah you can see so may follow suit and move out of the house in which unmarried sons live together the simba or the senior son must also be the first to initiate agricultural activities in the abandoned homestead of his dead parents we find now maybe the parents died so the senior son now become the hierarchy goes not you know it goes not the senior son to begin the harvest you know the generational seniority is also evoked through such practices for example the father and the mother of a man must Now here is where I was curious and this is where divorce is not uh, this is where divorce is not really easily seen in african society look for example the father and the mother of a man must sleep together the night before their son's marriage is consummated like yeah so if they divorced oh no 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 marriage you know ah <laughs> uh, is like it's a very interesting yeah uh, It's a very interesting uh, culture, but you know, so if they divorce, there's no marriage, you know. So you can see, you can see the duty, the the duty in marriage. So it's like you know, what they, clearly you can see a divorce is not an option. You know? But yeah, let's continue. The life cycle of a homestead offers a similar example. A newly married man. must build his first house in the homestead of his father and must move out and establish his own homestead when his own children are ready to marry 
a variety of similar rules exist governing complex temporal sequences. So you, I think so far what you have talked about, let me just uh, summarize. So far, what this guy is discussing, so that we don't lose uh, the direction of what's happening or lose the context, he's trying to so he's trying to show what time what time meant to this tribe, the lower tribe, what the importance of time. As you can see, the sequence of events. This is also a, a perspective of time, right? So even the aspect of uh, hierarchy, the aspect of just everything need, that needed to be done, the sequence in which everything needed to be done, it was related to time, like the time of the season, the time of the day, the time of, and also the chronology of the people, you know? Like, so you can see, like, you know, first wife, second wife, third wife, first born son, second born son, third born son. You can see all these things uh, happening. <laughs> were very much important in the name, were very much related to the perspective of time of the Luo people. So let's continue. A variety of similar, a variety of similar rules exist. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, even the serving of beer. Failure to observe these rules in their specific order is believed to result into severe supernatural sanctions, including death or infertility. So yeah, okay. these are the consequences, which are not only personal, but spread through families. Again, according to a degree of closeness and reckoned through genealogical seniority. So you can really literally, the whole clan, you can literally cast a clan, you know? So the, there's a lot of motivation for these things to happen the way they are. Otherwise the whole clan might be, you know, might be dealt a curse. Misfortune is the most explained as a violation of the proper sequence of time. Sequen uh, when you violate this sequence. So you can find that because there's a lot of uh, motivation in, in, in the proper sequence. And you can see even, for example, the death of, of one woman was explained as the result of her having brewed and served beer before the first wife of her homestead and done so. Over and had, wait. oh yeah, she, she brewed and served beer before the first wife. So when, when she dies, like, oh, yeah, it's because of that, you know, that thing you did that time, that one time you did that thing, yeah, that's cause that's, the, that's probably why it, yeah. <laughs> things did not go well to you because you know, and these things are these superstitions are still held on till today, till today. This like, uh, like these things are just held, like, like you know, <laughs> like people died for if you die, especially for an unexplained reasons, you happen to just meet. You know, it's because you did this and did this, and this is why, you know. So the, this, this, this beliefs are still carried on till today. The death of another man was attributed to the fact that his younger brother had married. Oh, look. You see, this is, look at this. This is why my cousins were, my first, my cousin who was the first one, he was forced into marriage quickly before his second one was married. The death, because you can see that, hey, nobody wants to risk. Nobody wants to risk. You know, nobody wants to anger the ancestors. So in this, in one case, a man lived alone in his new homestead for months with his wives. <laughs> a man lived alone in his new homestead for months with his wives passing cooked food over the fence, like because his first wife was was ritually prohibited from entering the gate before the, she had completed another prerequisite activity. You see, his part, look, now this is what I'm talking about. His first wife, this man was getting punished by his first wife because his first wife refused to do something that was ritual and he was stuck. He was, the man now he is stuck. He's like, okay, I, this other women cannot, the homestead has to, cannot, this other women cannot join the homestead. This other women cannot perform the activities of the homestead. Now he's stuck in his, in his homestead for months. You know, so you can see how the liver, you see, this is an example of a woman using 
what her, her uh, what she could uh, what is it her leverage to punish <laughs> her husband you know <laughs> So he's in his, even the wife, so the wives are passing food over the fence because <laughs> the man cannot leave his homestead. He cannot, you know, he, he's stuck because the because there is a specific sequence of events that needs to be followed, you know. So, well, anyway, so it's this is what I was going to say. This is, look at the the dynamics between men and women during that time, you know. It's a, it's very interesting. It's very, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, but this is, this is a society that is ruled by. Now I wonder if this will happen in a society that is ruled by a king or a queen. I don't know. We'll look at that. But this is a society that is not ruled by a king or a queen or any class. There's no ruling class. It is just the constitution, or in which a specific order of things need to be done. So, so whoever, so whoever, whatever, when it comes to your, if you're in that, when it comes to your turn to do what you need to do, if you don't do it, you you have the power to, you know, it's very, it's, I don't know, I think it's also improve. It it gives a, a culture, it gives you a perspective of the whole clan, or and your role as a cog in the whole system. You know, it gives you that interesting perspective, and it's, I, don't know, I think it's also very powerful. Feel like it's very powerful, and you know, as you can see, some people they when they abuse it, when they have the fact that one person can just stop the whole homestead from functioning, like that. I don't know. I feel like I don't know. Maybe 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 that's also a, an African version of equality. You know, like uh, yeah, you know, somebody's role can stop the whole clan from just functioning because somebody stopped their role. So it's a very interesting, I don't know, it's a very interesting way of uh, life. So this pervasive structuring of action through ritual sequence of time has the effect of shifting dispositions towards seniority and authority and naturalizing social relations with that underlying so you can see, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So who is senior in such a in in a, in, a, in such a society? Who is senior? You know, it's a very interesting. Uh, it's a question. That's a very interesting question. Like, in who is seen in in uh, in a society where everybody's role is important, and if they don't perform their role, then everything is grinds to a halt. Who is the senior person there? By, no, but yeah, by linking structures of authority to the natural passage of time, basically I think what he's saying is the elder is senior. Yes, yes. Whether it's an elder woman or an elder man, yeah, that's the, I think that's this African society. By linking structures of authority to the natural passage of time, and experiencing the evocation of authority in the continual repetition of ritualized sequences, such structures appear as eternal and ineluctable. I don't know what, another word that I don't understand the meaning, but I probably just cannot be changed. You know? Sequences of ritual actions are also, also create a sense of time passing which may serve to establish and maintain social relationships linking individuals or families. For example, the protracted series of wedding ceremonies, including the presentation of gifts and counter gifts, using use time as a means of creating the experience of mutual obligation and connection of, between families. As uh, this guy noted, the very concept of repressive repre Reciprocity. English reciprocity relies upon a manipulation of the duration between sequential acts of giving. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. Duration may also be invoked to express differences in status symbol symbolically. For example, female infants are kept in the house for three days after birth 
before being exposed to the sun, while male infants are kept indoors for four days and throughout and, oh, wait and throughout life, this pattern is repeated in other practices, such as such as the custom that after death in the family, females should not go into the agricultural fields for three days and males for four days. This is Mboya. This is written in 1938. Mboya. You see, this is why this is why I like this uh, paper because it it, uh, it it cites African sources. Like Boya is a Kenyan Kenyan historian also who wrote this thing in 1938. So history is conceived as a cyclical unfolding of generations, as noted, but also a linear sequence of unique events. The events serve to anchor history in a framework of shared cap shared practical experience. Many kinds of events may serve as a time markers. What is essential is that they, they be in some sense remarkable and communally experienced, like famines, livestock, livestock epidemics are by far the most frequent prominent general time markers. Every Luo has in memory long series of such disasters stretching back before his or her birth. Personal experience overlapping with parental, parent tales, her mind's sketch of the past are known individually by name. Oh, so each famine has a name, but famine, uh, but famines are also yearly, right? Because that's what they said. Usually, a name derived from some peculiar characteristic of the famine. For example, care, long and severe famine that occurred during the First World War. It is named after the verb care, which means to scatter because it forced families to scatter into different directions in search of food. After a slight amelioration of the harvest in 1918, farmine returned in 1919, and this one was called Chwekode, meaning stay in it. Choka, an earlier short but extremely severe farmine in 1907, is named after the verb Choko, which means bring together, a reference to the fact that all Luo were brought together because there was nowhere that had any food. Okay? Nyangweso, this is a kisi name. It's a Luya name. I don't know. A farmer in, in 1932 is named after the locusts. Nyangweso is a Luya name. See how this is also an interaction of different tribes. Nyangweso is named after the locust which caused the farmine. The farmine in 1980, oh, 1980, okay. I thought it was just, okay, even just 40 years ago. 1980 was called Maknugo Chori, which means catch your waste, <laughs> catch the waste of your husband. A reference to the long lines of people waiting for maize and, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, catch the waste of your husband. That's the name of the farm of 1980. Mm. You can't forget this type of name. It's no wonder they are remembered. <laughs> uh, so the list of such disasters is long. And uh, such and farming such as Ndunda, Nyakasiri, Madara, Madara. Uh, Madara is the name of a farm over farming, okay? And the cattle epidemic in Dusue date back to the turn of the century and earlier. Before, before colonial records allow us to calculate the precise chronological date for them, the Lua way of dating, the Lua, the, Lua, the Lua way of dating them provides a good example of how they calculate historical duration as well as sequence. Nyakasiri was a farm during the first money was introduced. These copper-colored coins were called Lando, and women were named after this money, who were named after this money. Oh my God, I know somebody called Orlando. <laughs> was said to be mature, Ooh, ready for marriage. At this, at this stage, at this ex as this example suggests, the penetration of the exotica from outside lower land into local consciousness 
such as the introduction of foreign objects or concepts of another source of of another source of market events. For example, the introduction of coinage. Okay, this is money coins, and even particular types of coins such as lando. Okay, so because of that, they also they, they they even have dates for the introduction of like okay, this is when copper came to like uh, Luo land or to the Luos. They they called it lando and. Uh, but copper coins, not copper. Copper coins came to do and they called it Lando. And because of that, it became actually a marker over, over history in the culture, in the Luo tribe. Interesting. The introduction of a system of metric weights, the first sighting of an aeroplane. <laughs> the first, oh, look at this. The first sighting of an airplane and the European world wars. All these are, have become cultural markers in the Luo, in the Luo tribe. I mean, I've become historical markers. So interesting. So when Luos were conscripted into the military, okay, oh, so this is when there were Africans being fighting for the world war, fighting were, were forced to fight in the world war. It became a marker, it became a tribal marker in the history of uh, in the in the in the in the Luo tribal calendar that became a marker. Mm. Okay, chronological. It became a chronological marker, allowing people to establish a relationship with other events or cycles, and fix them in time. Both places and people are often linked to these events through names. For example, so there are even people, even the babies in that generation were named. These are the names were given so that they. So okay. Yeah. For example, markets are sometimes named after farmers during which, okay, when a market, okay, like Nyangweso, and one finds children with such names as Kilo. <laughs> oh my God. So, named after the metric weight kilos, you know, kilograms. So, guys were named, so they were, they were little kids called Kilo. Okay. Or Poda, after the introduction of soap, oh, soap powder, they were called Poda. And uh, oh my God, pop after the visit of the okay, okay, <laughs> okay. they are uh, okay, okay. Is it? It is important to note that although these time markers are derived, you know, you know, they were they were they were jokes that they are actually little kids named. Uh, what is it? I've forgotten the name. Uh, I think during Barack Obama's, uh, Obama comes from the Luo tribe. If, if for those who don't know, Obama comes from the Luo tribe. This is the tribe we are talking about. Obama comes from it. And when he became president, there was a huge influx of, uh, so it's like, of, uh, yeah, kids named uh, after the, I don't know, what, the name. Apart from Barack Obama, of course, there were those named Barack Obama, but there was somebody, I forgot the name. I think is it in a, there's something, I forgot the name. You know, they were just all, I don't know if White House or something. I don't know. They all, and you know, I thought it was like a joke. I thought it was like it was just people making fun. But now that I'm reading about this, I realize no, this is just what you think is a joke. It's not a, this is actual culture. This is actual. This is actual uh, tradition. So yeah, there were a bunch of kids, I think around 2006, a bunch of kids named Barack Obama, others were named interesting names like White House or something, I don't know. But, uh, and I realized, no, man, this is, it's not funny. This is just part of the culture. And I, I'm like, okay. Yeah. We continue, you know? So I've understood, you know, I've understood. In fact, there were those, uh, named when even there are those named after after the birth of the even the royal royal like like I'm sure there'll be kids named uh, Charles or uh, you know I don't just because of the the event that happened people people here they tend to they tend to name their kids after such events such historical markers. 
okay? It is important to note that, that although these time markers are derived from shared experience, they are sometimes of local rather than universal relevance. Many famines were very widespread, but even widely spread natural disasters often affected different areas within lower land people. Such events as livestock, yeah, livestock epidemic, famines, caused drought or locust devastation, struck some areas earlier than others. And in some cases, areas escaped relatively unscathed. Consequently, they may be known different names from different areas. Sequential historical chronologies of this sort are therefore very local. However, people are generally aware of names and events in neighboring areas and capable of correlating events. Because of time markers depending upon the force remembered of remembered experience, the further back into historical time one travels, the less closely history is linked to this biographical. So the less such time markers continue to orient the passage of time, the more history becomes a story of generation cycles marked by segmentation, events, and popular movements. Let me try to understand this paragraph. Okay. So basically some time markers last only a generation. And the uh, other structures of history. Yeah, basically some time markers last only a generation and other, st other, st other structures of history take play, other, other time marker, other markers of history become more dominant. As, as you go maybe in the hundreds of in the centuries, the generational time markers make less sense and the, history, the bigger time markers tend to take over. Like, you know, like segmentation, like maybe splitting of clans and uh, popular population movements. Okay. Okay, okay. I think we're about to... Okay, okay, so here is biological time. I think biological time is pretty much straightforward. Basically, we talked about it when the breast fall, when the menstruation happens, when a man begins getting attracted to women, you know? That's a bio... bio oh, it's not biological, it's biographical time through an articulation of cyclical structural patterns. Yeah, this usually involves a process of reckoning by a system very similar to terminus post quem. Terminus, okay, this is some, uh, some interesting. For example, a woman placed the time of her marriage as shortly before farming during which people ate low. Okay, now this is just personal time. This is how you keep track of your age. So you the one who, you know, like the time of your marriage was before the farming. So you you know you can say, Oh yeah, so somebody can that's how I think uh, the elder generation in the sixties, you know, there were a bunch of people. In the new country where you people you can't your ID needs your age, birth certificate, you can't, you know. Uh, I think even my mom, my mom, she did, you know, she, <laughs> she didn't get a birth certificate, and so you just you just have to roughly I think the, the things that make you know your age are like okay, there was a farm, the first farmer, a farmer in called Nyangwe. So oh, because each farmer in had a name. So you kind of uh, okay, you could pretty much accurately trace your date of birth to your to the month. You could accurately, I think that was the what this guy is trying to say. He remembered this particularly because as the new bride expected, yeah, okay, because like this lady here, 
calculating age is done in a similar fashion. For example, two old men comparing their ages might say during the famine of care one. No, during the famine of care, I had just I had just begun to notice girls or my six my six teeth were removed. This was a initiation practice as a practice for young boys. Yeah, I see. During the famine of Choka, Oginga, Oginga Odinga, the first president, the first vice president of Kenya, and a prominent political fi figure today. Okay, I think this was back in the day. He's, this guy is dead now, but uh, yeah. noted that in noted in his auto, auto, autobiography that he recalled his birth date by re, he, recall, he, he recalled his birth date by recalling that the time he was just old enough to begin looking after his family's animals. He remembered them, a man he, he knew wearing khaki jumper and a red flap. And that man later told him that he had a jumper at the end of the First World War. He remembered being left alone to care for his younger siblings while his mother left to search for food during the famine of care. His mother told him that he was born during the short rings, so he was able to place his, that day, his date of birth on October 11, 1911 on October 1911, basically, yeah, specific. he could uh, trace his date of birth to the month, which basically is October 1911. But the day was very more, I think the day is would be much more difficult. The year, the year Higa, or oh, Higa is here, is used as a term of temporal reference. Yeah, basically, he's talking about how he, he got his, uh, yeah. He traced his date of birth. So this brief discussion of Luo conception of time, this is the conclusion, is obviously insufficient to, convey, to convey their true complexity. Obvi okay, yeah, this is actually something I have to say. That this is actually much more complex than what I've just what I've just read about. Yeah, it's way complex, and uh, it require it might require like several, uh, <laughs> I dare say, years of study just for this one culture. To, to get it right because it's not just this is just a juju this is just a, a bit of a shallow just a shallow just to give you a small idea but there are way more complex processes complex sequences to, to determine that determine time i think they, that's why they could determine time from to the to the month because there are so many things they detected and i realized also yeah moreover this single case cannot be, because if you read, this is not a something, this is, if you read uh, the history of uh, Southern Luo and uh, also living with the prehistoric people, this is, uh, this one, that was, I don't know who wrote it, but it's, it was about the Kikuyu of Mount Kenya and uh, the Luo. You find that, but okay, not that one. The, the, the first, the history was, I think it was written by, I think it was already referred here or got, you can find that you can this guy you can actually uh, trace uh, or write a history back I think more than 500 years ago 600 years ago I think even 700 I think back to the 1400s when uh, when it is uh, like just because through this complex uh, network complex not complex network complex way of of, yeah, of viewing time I think because the guy who wrote it he was a Luo, and he says that he could uh, trace it back, back to the 1400s. And he wrote the whole, it's a whole book about the history. Uh, each, each specific with the time frame, and this is according to all this complex uh, determination. It's, a, it's actually, that's a book that's referenced a lot. If you look about the history of Kenya, that's a book that's, because of it, uh, it, you know, <laughs> the work done was Tara. So you can, re because of that, it's easier. You know, people think because African culture, you can't trace back time, but we, because of this other way of, of our, our own way of, of uh, detecting time or uh, symbolizing time, you can actually trace back a lot of history back to even a thousand years. You can really, you can really be traced just because of which farming name. I think that's even how archaeologists do it with the, uh, like when you talk about Egypt, ancient Egypt, that's how they, before carbon dating, this is how they used to do it. And now even, and, and even the funny thing is, 
when they did carbon dating and when they did they use modern technology it it uh, and they and they and they what they may, what is it uh, compare it with uh, this these books that are written by this the first the first uh, people of the first kenyans to read and write they all, if you look at the books when they were, they were writing when there was no you know this technology that is used today about carbon dating it wasn't that thing then so when they were, when they started writing these things and now we have carbon dating and we have all this uh, history modern technology when they compare it's ac- it comes out as accurate so it means that this way of this system wasn't just you know it was it was it was uh, it was reliable that's what i'm trying to say that this is a very reliable system because they can trace it even back to the migration patterns all that they can trace it using all this modern technology they use even they even use uh, ai these days i, I saw somebody and but these are africans the kenyans from maseno university they are using ai to trace back how old how 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 old the languages are and how when a language is split into different clans you can just use by the languages this clan speak or this tribe speak you can you can like nilots and bantus they're using ai it's maseno university they're using ai to trace back when these clans were one tribe and when they split when you know it's a, it's a very um, um it's a very exciting time for academics in africa so they are doing a lot of great stuff the students of maseno university i would like to see i think they have an app actually for you to, to check it out i might even post the link in a later date when i uh, find it so yeah the law also share with archaeologists the need for open an operational system of reckoning time which is capable of discerning two essential aspects sequence and direction basically if you're trying to reckon time or if you're trying to observe time you have to observe the time duration and sequence like the chronological se- sequence of events and how long they took so that's what archaeologists do when they do well, when they do their they practice their their trade right and so even they saw that even this guy says even the luo did that so for the luo the past and present time are not reckoned in a single homogeneous scale that that they are linked through a relational system which articulates repetitive cycle a repeat which articulates a repetitive cycle of conceptions of different durations with a linear sequence of events curiously although archaeologists aspire to a homogeneous chrono- chronometric charting of the past <clears throat> the way they are usually able to date sites in practice oh, okay in the way in practice or oh, although they may want a homogeneous chronometric charting of the past but in practice usually ends up resembling much what yeah, of what the luo do basically they may they may want like a specific the way they may want just you know the way we use our time right now you know specific to the second right to the millisecond they may they may want that type of you know chronological so like this year this happened this year this happened you know like the way we look i don't know how our time the modern time system is it because of the planets or something yeah? i know i think that's what they're talking about let me see the brilo the brilo college system of termini post or antiquem estimates based upon cross dating exotic objects building and destruction levels volcanic events oh yeah it basically there's ah, no, no no this is just saying the same thing that this is just the same way archaeologists look for time it's pretty much the same way the east african tribes used to look for time moreover many of the catastrophic events which might have visi- might be visible to archaeologists and serve as markers in their dating schemes are also likely to have been significant time markers for the people who experienced them that's a that's actually a good point that as archaeologists like the time like okay there was a volcanic eruption during this year and the, it becomes a marker for an archaeologist that probably was also a marker for those people who were there like oh yeah you know so yeah yeah it's basically i think even the bible that's how, how do they tell time in the bible 
it's because of the events, right? That's how they will tell when the Bible, when these events in the Bible took place. They could, the way they, they, they tell them is through the same method these guys are doing here, right? It's the same method, right? Because, <laughs> because the Bible, they weren't using this time system of, that we're using. Even in the Bible, they weren't using this system of time that we're using. But the archaeologists can still trace back those uh, specific dates. The same way this tribe here, or this East African tribes, you can still date, you can still date, you trace back these specific dates. However, the use of different types of clocks constitutes different representation of time, which may result in the structuring of practice according to different rhythms. And this may entail differences, differences in social meaning of time. Perhaps the most significant observation of relevance in this connection is the specific way the temporal perception and experience permeate and structure all aspects of real life. For example, models of reckoning history, structure, and perception of present social distance and personal identity is linked to the units and events by which temporal duration is, is oriented. Okay, yeah, it's good. It's academic uh, languages. Gori, 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 gori. I have no idea what I did. <laughs> ah. What does this mean? I have no idea what I've just read. Let me continue to see, maybe you can make sense. Moreover, ritualized sequence of actions and alive and continually reiterate the structure of, re of Luo disposition towards authority. In these ways, Luo dispositions towards time structure and the rhythms of daily practice, and through the habituation of the body, practice serves to reproduce and naturalize the structure of social relation. Basically, they're saying, okay, now I've understood. What they're saying is, for example, perhaps the most significant observation of the relevance of this connection. I think they're talking about the connection between time and social uh, activities, the way the temporal perception and experience, our time and the social structure. You know, again, my bed may just be saying the same things in just so many different paragraphs in different words, but it's critically saying the same things. In this way, low disposition towards time structure of daily practice. Basically, yeah, basically just time structures their social relations because I think you've already talked about this. It's just saying the same thing in a way more complicated uh, way of speaking. But it's basically talking about how the, the tribe, uh, how time, how time determines the social activities of the tribe, including the, the dynamics between uh, the wife and the husband. The reciprocal relationship between the perception and the reckoning of time and the representation of the social relations is something that must be acknowledged by archaeologists, even those who claim to be operating only on the scale of uh, I think this is a specific way of working. Okay? I'm going to have to Google this stuff. Uh, Second, let's see what this means. Long dure means uh, it's a French word. It means the study of it focuses on the events that occur nearly. imperceptibly over a long period. Basically, it focuses on the slow changing relationships between people and the world. 
Oh, so it's it's okay, okay. So when what you what they're saying here is that uh, archaeologists should be very should be looking at the, the small uh, changes in people's in the society and the people's relation to the world. Small changes over like centuries and over a long period of time. However, it is especially critical for archaeologists who must grapple with the agency and international archaeology. This is just talking about archaeology. I'm more interested in the tribe. Duo case demonstrates both the complexity, the complexity of the ways that passage of time is conceived and of and reckoned in other societies, and the critical importance that perceptions of time have in determining this, have in structuring and reproducing social relations. An appreciation of these features is critical to the progress of interpretation of past societies, despite the difficulty it poses. The Luo case indicates that the investigation of such articulations coupled with the increasing attention to temporal issues in the, oh my God. Now, okay, you guys, I've, I've posted the link to the article. You guys can research these words. I think it's done. We're done today. Yeah. But basically I've learned something. Hopefully you guys might have also seen something you learned one, two things, but yeah, I think I'm done. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it today. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Not certain how much free women will uh, we'll discuss this <laughs> the later date, but Let me see, see, see the comments. Yeah, 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 we'll discuss this in a later date. But yeah, thanks guys for joining. But yeah. Don't forget to donate and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, have a good... Uh... Wait, where is this? Have a, have a great night. <laughs>